Good evening and welcome to the June 10th uh, City Council meeting and we also have a public hearing tonight and I'm happy to see a robust uh, audience here today and many speakers signed up so thank you so much for making time to share your comments with us. Uh, we are uh, going to begin with a ceremonial Pledge of Allegiance today. Uh, we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance in separation of the official flag. It is an honor of Flag Day of the United States of America. The flag was adopted on June 14th, 1777, and a day for Americans to affirm their commitment to liberty and justice for all. And joining us in leading the pledge are several of the Eugene Police Cadets. Would you all please come to the front? The The cadet program is a volunteer opportunity that provides a positive experience for young people ages 16 to 20 who are interested in learning and developing skills that will assist them in whatever career they choose. Once accepted into the program, cadets learn all facets of law enforcement, including riding along with officers and assisting them throughout their shift, working in the 911 communications center, and helping with police training and more. They also assist as role players for defensive tactics trainings for officers, school shooter trainings at local schools, and many other trainings. We are honored tonight to welcome the young men and women representing the Eugene Police Cadets who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Their names this evening, and please raise your hand when I call your name, uh, Cadet Caleb Pruitt, Cadet Adelina Rios, Cadet Laura Nusser, and Cadet Chance Cummings. Thank you all for joining us, and would you all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your well done, service guys. to the community. Thank you. Mayor, have a point of privilege? Yes, go, go ahead, Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that um, four times a year we take the Pledge of Allegiance and we do that on very special days, one of which is Flag Day, one of which is Veterans Day, one of which is Memorial Day, and one of which is the July 4th. So we try to honor those particular holidays by doing the Pledge of Allegiance and having young people and, our, and other not so young people come and talk about and do a presentation on that. So, um, so to those that think that we aren't appropriately acknowledging those holidays, I just want to point out that's why we do that and that's why we have people come and like read the entire constitution to us on July 4th which we can look forward to again, I suppose, in the near future. Declaration. Declaration. I mean, Declaration of Independence. Independence. Sorry. Constitution. Not the Constitution. That would be really long. long. Please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Now we're ready to begin with our public forum. Uh, I'm just going to give you a heads up that we have a full public forum and we have a full public hearing afterwards. So I am going to reduce the time on the public forum to two minutes uh, because we have... Uh, let's see, how many do we have? We have 40 people testifying in the public forum. So let me just review the rules for all of you. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have two minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of two minutes. So I will call two names at a time. The first person can speak. The second person can wait in the, in the warm-up chair so that we move through this uh, with, um, you know, efficiency. So first up, we have Todd Boyle followed by Sabrina Siegel. Todd Boyle, uh, Eugene, I'm in Alan Zelenka's ward. I am a, uh, a U of O alum, and uh, I worked as, for 25 years as a CPA, and so this is my annual statement of my credentials. That's why I know everything. Okay. Uh, there are 36,000 people living in Eugene on less than $1,000 a month, and we would like to have a system where people can house themselves on a normal, normalized basis and pay for their housing. 
it would cost about $4 billion to build the uh, 13,500 units of backlog at the current cost of public housing. And the current cost of the private sector developers is higher. And so it's not working. It is a crisis and something has to be done about it unless you want to accept the premise that it's okay the way it is. So I don't accept that. I think that it's not okay the way it is and that something has to change. And so I'd like to offer the idea that um, we will have a new zoning called R1L for low income housing zoning. And that zoning will have some uh, range of features, as is often said in policy speak, and one of them might be to allow people to divide their lots into 1,000 square foot pieces and with the deed restrictions so that it would only be for low income people and with the uh, rent caps or whatever might be make that targeted for these people who are in a crisis. Um, it also might include um, using some of our wasted excess land that's used uh, for streets. We could condemn some of our three square miles of street which was uh, Joe Minikazi, one of his central uh, points in his uh, talk that he gave a month ago. We have all this street space. Why don't we close some blocks and we can build some low income housing right down. One block would, would, would hold uh, 50 units and you wouldn't have to buy any land and you could put some, uh, some foundations right there on that beautiful asphalt and some nice little uh, plywood housing. And uh, that would get uh, 50 people housed and you could sell them. They would cost $50,000. Your mortgage would be about $400 a month. The city would make a profit Anyway, there are many ideas like that that are unthinkable, but they have to be thought about. Thank you. Thank you. Sabrina Siegel, followed by Becky Bruckner. Hello, um, Sabrina Siegel and Allen's Ward. Um, a notice to city attorney, city council, and city manager. Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum said, the strength of our government institutions depend on the public trust, and public trust can be quickly eroded when people don't feel they have access to the work their government is doing or when they can't get answers to reasonable questions. Under the Oregon Public Open Records Law, the city manager or his agents are required to release any alleged report or communication between the city attorney and any member of the city council. If the communication is not a type that is exempt under non-confidential government attorney-client privilege, this communication fits all of the public records legal criteria and therefore exempts it from a attorney-client privilege when there are there were no secret or confidential communications between the city attorney the city council members or city manager two there was no current or pending litigation involved three only policy or general information had been requested not confidential legal advice pertaining to litigation for the city attorney was not asked to keep this communication confidential. It was only a clarification of the anti-commandeering doctrine and how it might affect the city council's ability to pass a moratorium on 5G. This type of request for public information is not privileged. Five, the information contained within this alleged communication is really available through other sources. Six, the attorney, the city attorney is a public official with a client duty to the people of Eugene. Seven, refusing to release non-confidential records erode the public trust in city government. Thank you. Thank you. Becky Bruckner, followed by Abraham Lewarnick. Lickwarnick, sorry. Becky Bruckner, uh, number eight, any action or lack thereof by the city council or city manager based on a secret communication from the city attorney would be legally void. The public, number nine, the public is not an adversary of the city council, so there should be no need for secrecy. Secrecy under these circumstances could be construed as non-fiance and fraudulent concealment when there is a moral or legal obligation to be transparent. Number 10, disclosure of information concerning the conduct of the people's business is a fundamental and necessary right. Number 11, both the city attorney and Councilor Betty Taylor publicly announced the conclusion of the city attorney's opinion, thus waiving any erroneously labeled privilege. 12. The city attorney cannot just give the public a one or two sentence opinion on the law without backing it up 
with factual information as to how she came to her conclusion. How can the people have trust in a government that acts in such a secretive manner? 13. Whether or not the U.S. Supreme Court's anti-commandeering doctrine allows the city council to pass a moratorium halting the permitting of small cell towers in the city of Eugene is of vital importance to the people of Eugene. Therefore, the city attorney's opinion that it does not allow a moratorium in contradistinction to the attorney general of Oregon's opinion that it does must be scrutinized for purposes of possible rebuttal and correction. This cannot be accomplished if this alleged communication is not made public. We respectfully demand a copy of any written communication between city attorney and any city council member or city manager relating to the question of the anacommodering doctrine and its effect on the council's ability to pass a moratorium on the permitting of small cell towers in Eugene. Thank you. Uh, Abraham Lekwarnik followed by Joshua Korn. Abraham Lekornick, domiciled Southwest Eugene. <clears throat> Two sections of the Oregon Constitution. Section one, natural rights inherent in people. We declare that all men, when they form a social compact, are equal in right, that all power is inherent in the people, and that all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness and they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in any such manner as they may think proper. Section 26, no law shall be passed restraining any of the inhabitants of the state from assembling together in a peace peaceable manner to consult for their common good, nor from instructing their representatives, not from, nor from applying to the legislature for a redress of grievance. The 260 people of Families for Safe Technology have consu um, consulted for our common good. We have decided that having cell tower antennas every 300 feet, many f in front of homes, is unsafe, unhealthy, and aesthetically an eyesore and lowers home resale values. We are afraid of being assaulted by unsafe, high-intensity electromagnetic waves 24-7. This makes us very unhappy, and we will not feel peaceful until small cell antennas are prohibited from the streets of Eugene. I hereby instruct you within the next 30 days to pass a moratorium halting the permitting and installation of small cell towers and antennas in and around Eugene. If you fail to do so, you will be in violation of the people's fundamental rights, Thank the you. Oregon Constitution, and Thank your you. oath of office. Thank you. Joshua Korn, followed by Barbara Wade. Joshua Korn, South Eugene. Uh, regarding 5G wireless technology, in the past I've discussed how this is not about smartphone download speed and that there's been no health and safety testing, there's crazy disinformation campaigns about this technology and that this whole 5G frenzy this by the industry has a, an agenda of avoiding testing so they can implement this technology quick before we before the public realizes that uh, how much harm this has the potential of creating and that children are most at risk because of nosebleeds headaches fatigue already with the current tech current wireless technology never mind the higher frequencies of the 5G and this is a huge experiment on the public and uh, that insect and bird populations have already been, been impacted, that it's affecting insomnia, miscarriages, affecting uh, uh, birth rates and neurological and memory issues. And uh, and you know now now you guys have been uh, have been noticed on this anti commandeering act. You can tell if you don't if you don't realize this. This is a jurisdictional argument. This is a jurisdictional issue. You've been noticed. 
property values are going to decrease if you allow this to happen and you will have liability on that. So it's time for you guys to do what you need to do and, uh, and, and have an emergency moratorium on this issue because if you don't, freedom inf information uh, requests are, are going to be filed and it will come out what what has been communicated between you guys, and and you're you're going to be liable, and um, your personal bonds at risk. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Barbara Wade, followed by David Ivan Piccioni. Hello, I'm Barbara Wade, um, <laughs> Ward One. Um, I'm actually going to share a letter from. Uh, uh, our House of Representative Peter DeFascio, uh, I feel in a way more represented by him than I do by my own uh, city council. Um, he's listening to, to people in this area. First, I'm going to skip through this. Thank you for contacting me with your concerns regarding fifth generation or 5G wireless technology. I appreciate hearing from you and share your concerns. We haven't even heard any of your concerns for our concerns, and I have only been a part of this for a month, but I know other people have been showing up here at these meetings since October, and I, I find that pretty reprehensible. Um, working in tandem with the FDA, the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, set guidelines for what is considered to be safe RF exposure levels for humans. Yet the FCC's current guidelines for RF safety was adopted in 1996. That's a long time ago. A time when our society's relationship with and understanding for wireless technology was uh, much different than it is today. Um, I'm gonna skip down further. Moreover, as you may know, the telecommunication Communications Act of 1996 legislation, which I opposed, prohibits state and local governments from regu regulating wireless infrastructure based on RF emissions, meaning that states and municipalities are forced to depend on the federal government for information about the safety of 5G technology. Uh, he tried to uh, help us at that time. We didn't, we didn't know where we were going with this, though. Um, he also, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. David Ivan Piccioni, followed by Carolyn Partridge. Hi, uh, I just first want to say that I don't stand up during the thing that you guys did because, not because uh, I want to be disrespectful to America, it's because I want to be respectful to the entire planet and not divide ourselves from other countries. We should be working towards all beings, not just Americans. Uh, so I think that through this trajectory that we've been going as a, as a population uh, is, should lead us to a point eventually in the future, in a hypothetical future, where we won't need the police anymore. Uh, people will use their serotonin instead of their dopamine. They won't be thinking about fight or flight. They will, the, 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 the brain is going to be used more wisely. Uh, serotonin, which is uh, the chemical that uh, connects the different nerves through the synaptic space, is uh, very uh, calming and uh, intuitive and peaceful and socially uplifting uh, endogenous part of our brains and of most animals. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's kind of ironic that uh, the people at the lower end uh, of the economy have to give money to the police because it's usually them who are at most risk than anybody else who end up homeless. And we know how the police react to the homeless. Uh, I don't think they, they treat them very well. I don't think that's the way homeless people we should, we should be treated. I think we should give the money to cahoots. That would be a good idea. Uh, Mm, yeah, so Occupy was a great experiment and it was shut down by the mayor at the time and the council, blah, 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 and the cops were the ones that had to do it. I think uh, the be Thank you. <clears throat> Carolyn Partridge, followed by Linda Heil. <clears throat> uh, 
Hello, my name is Carolyn Partridge and I live in Betty Taylor's ward. I was here on May 13th and I'm back again. And that's because two minutes is just not enough time. I'm concerned that Eugene is not going to meet its emission reduction goals. One opportunity to make progress is the upcoming franchise negotiations with Northwest Natural Gas, of which I am a customer. Natural gas has been touted as a bridge fuel for years. It stopped being a bridge fuel about 30 years ago. That was when we passed the safe upper limit of greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere. A gradual tapering off at that time would have been part of a realistic solution. But we took no action then, which means we must take more significant action now. Although gas burns cleaner than other fossil fuels, it still emits carbon dioxide, which worsens the climate situation. So really, we no longer have the option of natural gas as a bridge fuel. In May, I gave you two common sense suggestions for the new agreement. The company should not be allowed to expand service to new customers. And secondly, gas appliances should be replaced with electric appliances when they wear out. I think these two things will make the transition a lot less painful for all concerned. In closing, I just want to say that some people have been coming here week after week after week to push for a climate action plan that will actually accomplish its goals. They have spent months studying the issue and are damn well informed. I hope you are taking their input seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Heil, followed by uh, Roxana uh, Carter, Garner. Garner, thank you. <laughs> My name is Linda Heil, and I live in Ward 2 in Eugene. One of Kim Hiding's many inaccuracies and misrepresentations was that natural gas is necessary in all deep decarbonization scenarios done for the Pacific Northwest. In fact, E3 has produced three modeling studies that evaluate different scenarios in our region, and all renewable energy is a viable option. First, the public generating pool, which includes eWeb, commissioned a 2018 study focusing on the electric supply. And the preferred scenario included some added gas capacity to cover peak demand. Another 2018 analysis modeled electricity scenarios in Washington State using only renewables for climatesolutions.org, a Northwest-based clean energy economy uh, nonprofit. Its two preferred scenarios include gas to meet peak demand, but only biogas, no fossil gas, conventional, or fracked. The Northwest Natural Company commissioned a study on building space heating that compares two scenarios converting to 100% electricity and two scenarios that maintain direct supply of gas to buildings, which is their business. So Northwest Natural modeled for keeping its own business alive. All three reports confirm that deep decarbonization is possible by 2050 at an acceptable cost. The fundamental questions for Council are, will we plan for 100% electricity to serve all building energy needs, or will we maintain a gas supply for some homes and businesses that uses 30% biogas and 70% fossil gas as Northwest Natural uh, wishes? Do we make our electricity supply 100% fossil free or 80% lower carbon compared to 1990? As Councillor Surrett said, Northwest Natural's plans are anemic and light on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Ruana Garner. Garden. Garden. Thank Ruana you. Ruana Garden. I and, live oh, in Hang Spring. on one second. And she'll be followed by Robin Bloom Garden. Okay, now take it away. Hi, my name's Ruana Garden. I'm a Springfield person. And I'm here today because my Springfield City Council has no rights in this franchise. And they've informed me of that. So I want you to know that those of us in Springfield, we do not want expansion of natural gas. And once again, we'd like to encourage sub and other utilities in our area to encourage um, more electric use as the fossil fuel ga natural gas wears out. So I just want you to know that we don't have a place to speak in our portion of the city, of the county. But so we're speaking here with you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Robin Bloomgarden, followed by Jim New. <clears throat> okay, I'm actually speaking for Betsy Hitz, who forgot her reading glasses, and she resides in Ward 1. Uh, good evening. Northwest Natural is asking Eugene to continue supporting the use of their very dirty, very dangerous product. Their product is natural gas, which is methane, a, nat a greenhouse gas that is over 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide over the first 20 years in the atmosphere. Methane leakage is a serious problem resulting from our continued natural gas production, transport, storage, and use. Through Northwest Natural, though, Northwest Natural uses the American Gas Association's estimate of life cycle emissions national average of 1.2%. In reality, the leakage rate is significantly higher. A Colorado State University study published in July 2018 reported a leakage rate of 2.3% based on a five-year study at 700 facilities. The study was based on actual measurements rather than industry reports. Councillor Taylor asked um, two weeks ago whether Northwest Natural's gas is obtained by fracking. Northwest Natural reports that they obtain their gas from British Columbia, Alberta, and the U.S. Rockies. Much of that gas is fracked, and the percentages are increasing, according to sources cited by Tarika Powell of the Sightline Institute. Natural gas is a dirty and dangerous product, and the process of fracking compounds the environmental consequences. We are in a climate emergency and cannot afford to waste time on business as usual. We need a rapid phase out of fossil fuels. It is possible and it is affordable to heat indoor spaces and water and cook food without the use of natural gas. That's what we did before 1910 and we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Jim New followed by Debbie McGee. Mayor, City Council, and Manager, uh, City Manager, my name is Jim New. I live in Ward 7. I want to thank Councilor Surrett, Ye, and Taylor for their questions and comments at the Northwest Gas Work Session Wednesday, May 22nd. I share your concerns about Northwest gas fracked gas percentages, inequities, and offset by customers, and too anemic of carbon reductions in 30 years, among other topics. One phrase repeated several times by the Northwest Gas representative uh, was policy from SB 844. SB 98 and HB 2020 would frame their carbon reduction efforts as they were in uncharted territory, as she said. HB 2020 forecasts for Northwest gas customer price increases in 2040 will be 53% residential, which is $567 annually, small commercial 60%, $2,900 annually, and 117% for industrial with no costs listed according to the state spill 20 2020 carbon reduction forecasting. According to SB 844, the Oregon-wide cap and invest system would not lead to emission reductions by natural gas utilities because the utilities are either not incentivized to take action or they will find it cheaper to purchase allowances through costs passed on to their customers. SB 98 enables gas utilities to provide renewable natural gas generated from waste at landfills, dairies, and waste treatment facilities from five to in 2020 to 25% by 2045. Why not 100% by 2045? This would require new expansive infrastructure with costs would be passed on to their customers. The Smart Energy Program is already funding the NR RNG efforts with 12% of customers contributing $65 per year with 70% of that going to infrastructure and 30% to administration fees. Their program mantra reads, use less, offset the rest, and it should read, use less, pay, pay for the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Debbie McGee, followed by Linda Perrine. Good evening. My name is Deborah McGee. Eugene's been my city for 37 years. In 2016, Eugene City Council unanimously adopted a science-based 7.6 annual greenhouse gas reduction target that would result in emissions dropping 93 cent, 93 percent by 2050. I want to express my appreciation that you did this. It matters. Part of what makes it possible for Eugene to set realistic emission reductions is that our public utility, eWeb, is primarily powered by hydro, 90 percent. 
Higher temperatures and changes in precipitation are already having significant impacts on water resources in the Northwest. Winter snow accumulation in the mountains is a natural water storage system on which Oregon relies. Change in the timing of water supplies will decrease opportunities for electricity generation from hydroelectric dams. In fact, City of Eugene consultant Good Company shared data that says there will be no snowpack in the Oregon mountains in 22 years. Currently, eWeb meets peak demands by burning gas, but we know the extreme problems with the leaking and burning of methane. We must decarbonize our electricity. That is why we must move away from gas and on to renewables. We have wind and solar available now. Rooftop solar is great. If everyone who can afford it would, that would be excellent. But really what we need is to have utility scale solar, which can be more easily scaled up and becomes less expensive per unit of energy. My rural electricity provider, Lane Electric, put in a community solar garden. We bought two panels and are receiving monthly reductions in our bill. We need to reserve any renewable gas to power those things that are hard to electrify. I know you received some misinformation about the needs for continued gas usage in our community. It can be confusing and difficult to help people understand why we cannot keep doing our same lives. Please change the Northwest Franchise Agreement. We must face the reality of our situation. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Perrine, followed by Susan Selig. Good evening. I'm Linda Perrine from the 97405 part of Eugene. Um, the City Council has recently held work sessions with both Northwest Natural and EWEB to assess the city's ability to transition to lower carbon energy options. It is time for Eugene to move in the direction other cities, counties, and states from around the country are doing, committing to 100% renewable energy. To further the goal of 100% renewable electricity in Eugene, it is time to hold another kind of work session, one that evaluates the potential of local solar energy to meet a percentage of Eugene's energy mix. The City Council should request a solar work session with the following local solar companies, Energy Design, Advanced Energy Systems, Solar Assist, all located here in Eugene. In this work session, you should request each company provide their response to these questions. What percentage of Eugene's energy mix could come from local solar systems, utility solar, and community solar in the next 10, 20, and 30 years? What policies need to be implemented by eWeb to increase solar adoption in Eugene? Are grid tied systems possible with the current downtown electrical infrastructure? Where are the best choices for community solar in Eugene? What is the potential for microgrids in Eugene and how would you organize them? What is the current customer acceptance for battery storage systems in Eugene? The entire West Coast has excellent solar potential with all of it, including Seattle, having more annual sun solar hours than the country of Germany. California and Washington have already made 100% renewable energy commitments for their entire states. Portland is moving aggressively on solar as their solution to get off coal generation. Where is Eugene on seriously considering solar energy as a climate change solution? Putting all our eggs in the hydro basket is a very risky choice with an unstable climate future. Go solar now. Thank you. Susan Selig. Oh, okay, so we'll hold you, hold off on you. Then Donna Riddle, Donna, there she is, followed by Melinda uh, Jason or something. Donna Riddle, Springfield, Oregon. Um, I was driving downtown today and I saw that the uh, what was the Greyhound bus station has a big sign on it. It says uh, for sale or lease. And you know, last year you were talking about a navigation center and in the new report you're talking about a navigation center and that would be a wonderful navigation center. It has lockers, it has restrooms, it has a commercial kitchen um, and it has it could be converted, and you should consider that. You need to do less policing and more help for the people who are unhoused. Thank you. Melinda, and it's J-A-C-O-N, I think. Is Melinda here? No. All right. We'll set that aside. Major James Hatcher, followed by Patricia Duvall. Good 
Good evening. Okay, I've addressed the council before on this issue, and that's the issue of Saturday Market Free, free Speech Square. Okay, this last Saturday, I decided, well, I'm going to see what I can do to be able to have our canopy up to protect us from sunburn and so on. So I went to the information booth, and they said, oh, well, if you pay us $50 more, you can put up your canopy. Now, how is that right? Answer me that. How is that right? It's not right. All we're asking for is the same rights that Saturday Market, Farmer's Market has, and that's to have our canopies and stuff up to where we not only can protect ourselves, but protect our customers as well, and protect our products from getting harmed from sun and rain. It's as simple as that. It's not really that hard to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia Duvall, followed by Kayla McDonald. I'm Patricia Duvall. I'm also here about the free speech plaza here in Saturday Market area. Every time we, I have seen customers come around, they want to come take a look at their, our products, but without our canopies, our products end up getting so hot that they don't even want to touch it or come near our booth. It makes it a lot harder for all of our customers and ourselves to get anything done and to have nice producti productivity. If we can have the canopy back, it gets a lot more done and we can have a lot more communication going around through our customers and to have the Saturday Market Free Speech Plaza going every year. Please bring them back. Thank you. Kayla McDonald. Followed by Heather Allen. Uh, Kayla McDonald, Eugene. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for the patience and effort exerted on this particular matter. I am here once again, along with my colleagues, to express my concern for the lack of canopies and unfair treatment of the Wayne Morse Free Speech Plaza vendors. As you have been made aware, we do not have the ability to shield ourselves or our products from the elements. In fact, over the last two weeks, I have lost over $200 in products because of the heat. And uh, this is becoming an extremely serious issue for both myself and the other members as the temperatures continue to rise. And we still do not have the proper protection. What we are currently permitted is a handheld umbrella. We are now allowed to affix the umbrella to our chairs or non-covering structures of our booth, which is still only four by four feet. Uh, this hardly equates to the size of a closet, let alone the fact that we are trying to make a meager, meager living off the contents of this tiny space, which we are also having to battle the elements in full. If it's raining, we get to pick between getting sick or losing our life's work. And if it is sunny, even with umbrellas, we can only manage to shade ourselves somewhat. People who are sensitive to the heat can get heat stroke in as little as an hour. A large portion of the vendors here exhibit such traits. And I ask the council once again for its help on this matter. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Heather Allen, followed by Carol Shearer. My name is Heather Allen. I have been vending at Free Speech Plaza since end of last summer. I had a very delightful stand with a meager income to help support me. I am disabled with no SSI, no SSD, what money I make is what money I get to pay back to the people that have already invested in my personal bills. I have not been able to stand out there since then because you guys waver on what we can have for shelters. My doctor is appalled. He is ready to write letters to anybody I request because he knows I'm a vendor. This is my third year doing summer vendoring and I have very specific instructions that I am to avoid direct sunlight while I'm doing this. Limiting us to personal umbrellas is not going to help my health condition whatsoever. It was neurological. I didn't ask for it. I was born with it. I got sick twice just sitting in here from the heat. But I'm told that I have to deal with my product being ruined. <coughs> Customers getting sick, whether they're healthy or, well, or not healthy, I'm getting sick. 
because you won't allow us the appropriate coverage. And there's no transparency of who is making these decisions for us. Every time we go to ask, I have emailed Eric Brown regarding the umbrella six weeks ago. I have never received an email back. My doctor is ready to send letters. He is not happy with my health condition over this. And none of you guys are paying my personal bills. All you're doing is ensuring I'm going to wind up homeless. Thank you. Carol Shearer, followed by Michael Kerrigan. I'm Carol Shearer. I'm in Chris Pryor's ward. Uh, here we go. Uh, Lane County has approximately 3,000 unsheltered persons. Approximately 130 more persons become unsheltered each month. Most are in Eugene. HUD report dated December 2018 lists Eugene Springfield Lane County as the area with the highest rate of chronically unhoused individuals in this category in the nation. The report cites Oregon with the highest rate of unsheltered people and families with children in the nation. It is therefore important to cultivate understanding among the house community about homelessness. Policymakers need to develop programs that bring diverse groups together and encourage intermingling and cooperation while engaging unhoused in the process of planning and making policy decisions. The planning strip ordinance is a policy of division. It will pit small business owners against those who are more disadvantaged. It is a misuse of funds and a further indication we have a governance problem. Additionally, the proposed payroll tax will likely be used to pay officers to get property owners to sign trespass letters, as homeless can then be arrested without warning, jailed up for 10 days, and fined $500. It is a continuation of criminalizing the poor and is a violation of the U.S. Constitution. Do I sleep in the park and violate the camping ban, or do I trespass onto private park property? Where can I go to the bathroom? Where can I set my stuff down without attracting attention from police? We should not use our money to cause more suffering and stress, and especially not to those who need our help most. Let us build a better tomorrow for all of us with a community we can proudly show to our children as the loving way to live. Thank you. Michael Kerrigan, followed by Rich in Love. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Kerrigan. I live in uh, Ward 7. The uh, point in time counts results compiled by Lane County show that 13,070 people in our community experienced homelessness at one point last year. In addition, the one day count was a big increase over the previous year. I volunteered for the count the past two years and I've counted un unhoused fo folks all over our area. This is a serious, widespread crisis that needs our full attention. The city needs to declare a homeless state of emergency so we can use all the tools in our toolbox to effectively deal with the homeless crisis. Here in Eugene, it could help us cite our successful rest stops, build tiny house vet villages, more of them like Emerald Village, and utilize the Armory as a shelter and much, much more. The homeless state of emergency could help us implement the TAC report recommendations sooner and more effectively. Portland and Seattle have declared emergency and has made a big difference. It's time for us to take the same action. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rich Inlove, followed by Zondi Zinke. Good evening. Rich Inlove, uh, Ward 7. Claire Sewitt's my counselor. And I'd like to read to you uh, a notice that was given to me, and I get every year now, from my uh, management company. It's addressed to me uh, regarding notice of change in monthly rent. On an annual basis, we meet with both building owners to evaluate market value, services offered, and appropriate rent increases. Based on this, and in order to maintain a high level of service and quality, there will be a rent increase for your apartment, which will be $50. That's going to happen every year. Um, according to the law that was signed by uh, Governor Brown, 7% uh, plus inflation per 12-month period. Uh, this is the, me uh, the measure inflation is per CPI, 
consumer price index for Western states. Increase in calc the increase is calculated each September for next calendar year. For 2019, it's 10.3%. What's going to happen when the Fifth Street market is fully realized, when the eWeb property is fully realized, and the ripple effect of the property values going up? It's not going to be $50. It's going to be more than that. I will be forced to live in a motorhome. Now, I can live in a motorhome if you allow a property owner to say, you can have your motorhome on that property, or I can be on the street. But I am determined to try to keep a roof over my head. And I'm working for the 4J school district in an honest way, working with um, specialized children as an aide. And I plan to do that if, I, if my health keeps up for more year, uh, several years ahead. I'm asking you to please help us to live in a way that's responsible and dignified. Thank you. Thank you. John Dzinki, followed by Mary Osterman. The council just passed the payroll tax for a major expansion of the police. I want everyone to know that as they do this, they continue to give money to the top. Just give it. In a couple weeks, they are poised to gift property, the property of the steam plant to the de same developers who tried to steal Kesey Square from the people. And not only are they poised to gift them the property, they plan to throw in $4.1 million to help them do the renovations they want. You, uh, prior, you acted like we were all dumb. I, I watched every one of your meetings. I read every bit of material. And I'll let you know, you did not properly vet what this money was to be used for. Here is your great community court. Here's the docket from it. Criminal trespass two, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, open, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, marijuana in public place, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, interfere with public transport, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, open container, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, open container, open container, criminal trespass, Criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, open container, open container, criminal trespass, open criminal trespass, open container, criminal trespass, open container, open container, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container. That's the docket from one community court session, okay? That's what this money, some of this money anyway, is being spent on. Criminal trespass is when you're sleeping on the street and you've nowhere to go, right? Okay, that's, so we have charges that compete with Multnomah County in these misdemeanors, and they just said they've got to expand community court, they've got to expand police because they can't enforce all this stuff, okay? This is the junk you're doing to people whose lives are being ruined. Thank you. Mary, uh, Mary Osterman, followed by Gary Glass. Hi, I would like to address the council regarding the unfair treatment of free speech vendors, a direct example of the treatment aside from the canopy issue. I previously addressed is a fact that in the bus zone, there is, they let the Saturday market vendors and the farmer market vendors unload there. But if I go to unload, I'm told if I stop there, I'm going to get a ticket. I'm going to get more than one citation for it. I mean, last weekend, I've in the last two weeks, I've taken pictures of more than four cars sitting there for more than an hour and a half. And they won't do nothing about it, but I sh show up and I try to unload, which takes me maybe five minutes at the most, and I'm threatened with a ticket and to be towed. This is unfair. There should be the same rules for everybody that is there to vend and to unload. It shouldn't be because you're with market, Saturday market or farmer's market that you're treated special. I'm there just to make money so I can make it month to month. I've been vending at Saturday Market for over 20 years. I've never been treated the way I've been treated this year. I have been told I can't unload. I've been told I can't have water for sale in my booth. We can't have our canopies, which keep us out of the sun. 
keeps our, our customers out of the sun, which I have a lot of return customers that are disabled, which look for my my awning so they can be under it, so they can get out of the sun for a while. This us being told that it's a fire hazard or it's an insurance issue is ridiculous when everybody else can have them. Thank you. Jerry Glass, followed by Eric Jackson. I'm Jerry Glass and Eugene is my home. There are two ways that justice is administered here in Eugene. There are the, the, the rules for the rich, where they get away with everything, and there's the rules for the homeless people where we get harassed and discriminated against by the police. In 2008, I saw my three years of work and my retirement account go up in smoke. Where to go? I don't know. Poof, gone. No explanation. Nobody, nobody went to jail for the mishandling of the of the funds that were supposedly for my retirement. Then boom, gone. And not only that, I worked over here at the, at the Hilton over here, and they paid me twelve dollars an hour. Twelve dollars an hour. I asked for ways because at first I was working as a uh, person that um, set up for the construction. Then I started doing the construction. They wouldn't give me a raise. And I woke up one day and I read the paper, and they sold that motherfucker for eighty million dollars. I'm done with anybody trying to tell me that the laws, this thing, apply to me and not to them. I am being harassed by police, followed around, and I see my, my fellow people being done the same thing too, but no, they won't do anything with the rich people. They get away with anything they want. You know what the thing of it is, is I'm homeless, and I know a lot of people that are homeless, and we're going to bottleneck, and you're going to go like this, and we're going to push a cooker, and we're going to explode, and we will camp, and we'll go anywhere we want. Anywhere we want. We can and I'm not bullshitting you. I'm done with the discrimination. I'm, I'm fed up. Boom. Thank and you. I'm determined. I'm, I'm educated, and I'm determined. And I promise you, that's what's going to happen. Thank you, Eric Jackson, followed by Michael Gannon. Sometimes very, Jerry is very hard to follow up after. Um, I'm here today to talk about municipal court, money to expand municipal court. Probably not a bad idea if you're asking the state Supreme Court to make it a court of record. Court of record, what does that mean, Eric? That means they don't have a transcript. That means there is no recording. There is no transcript. There is no record in the court for people and their trials and what could potentially be misconduct by a judge, misconduct by a prosecutor, or poor handling of a case by a public defender. When you heard Zondi speak of the criminal trespass two charges, I've got four of them, two have been dismissed as I've talked to counsel over the previous year about. I have two more, I currently have 12 charges going to municipal court and a court not of record. A court not of record prevents me from having a record, which is illegal because in a court not of record, the standard is that the litigant is allowed to maintain a record, but not according to your judges. According to your judges, this is a court not of record. Therefore, you are not allowed to record. They post an ordinance. Um, for the state, that would be 165.543, which says you can't eavesdrop. You can't catch other people's conversations. In no way does it imply that you can't record your own proceedings. But the court doesn't allow you to. Wonder why? What are they hiding? Now, the reality is, if you guys ask the state Supreme Court, with all your expanded monies from payroll taxes, probably going to cost you less than 10 grand to make it a court of record and make the people that they're putting in jail have a valid stand to appeal or say that their lawyers were insufficient. Thank you. Michael Gannon, followed by Janet A. Hi, I'm Michael Gannon. I live in Eugene. I um, want to talk to you about yourselves a little bit because I've been um, coming to city council meetings in Eugene since um, the 1960s. 
And I don't think they're getting any better. I've brought my little issue of the um, safe intersections to your attention. And I know that the state of California, with the ninth biggest economy in the world, enforces those regulations on people driving there. Our state legislature voted to protect humans at the crosswalks. And you ignore that. And I know that the municipal court is a joke for the uh, community service. And I know that the um, CRO, the uh, effort to control our carbon emissions is like a egg on an old frying pan that keeps getting turned over and over and over. Nothing happens. And I've seen a lot of really bright people come down here and talk to you about it. There are so many things wrong with this situation that the public is disarmed. Our brains are becoming addled. Thank you. Janet A, followed by Timothy Morris. Janet A, and I'm allegedly represented by Ward 7, although I don't get return calls or information from my Ms. Surrett. So I'm here, I put on the paper, I was here to speak about the multi-unit property tax giveaway. And I think in sitting back there and watching the people come forward to the microphone, what I've observed is a clear imbalance of governance. Sorry, but your predecessors and you guys are doing a poor job. What we're seeing is a two-class system. The haves that get those MUPTs and every other little embellishment they're able to get at the expense of regular folks. We're creating a two-class system with the people that are very anchored. I came to speak also, I think that there should be a moratorium or consideration of those multi-unit property taxes for local folks, land people that live at their residence to provide low income housing rather than negotiating it in a secret deal. I just spoke with um, City Manager Rees about obtaining the deal done by OB Incorporated, what, how many units that low cost housing will be, and what exactly does the city call affordable housing? What's the criteria or the criterion in meeting that? It's so ambiguous that it's really hard to follow, and I, I'm convinced that it's purpose to be that way. I think transparency is so much needed, and there needs to be an eye to the folks that are being burdened or have been used by the system so that the upper class, what we're seeing is a two-class system being created with very angry people. It needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed soon. Thank you. Timothy Morris, followed by Al LePage. Good evening, Council. Uh, Timothy Morris, Ward 1. Uh, I came to speak to you tonight about the planter box um, uh, ordinance in front of you. Sorry, my brain just stopped working all of a sudden. Um, I came to speak to you um, with just a simple concern of while it looks nice that we have planter boxes and that property managers will uh, take care of these and that it will beautify our downtown and our, our neighborhoods. The fear that I have is that this will um, subtly be used to uh, gentrify and move unhoused and homeless people away from the downtown and away from the neighborhoods and away from the businesses. Um, I think that we cannot continue to put rules and regulations on the unhoused community without offering solutions. We have one coming up right now, the TAC report, which is being uh, approved on the budget coming up real soon here, but 
we have so many rules that are going up against the unhoused uh, population that we don't offer a solution. So thank you. Thank you. Al LePage, followed by Kimberly Gladen. Hello, counselors. Uh, my name is Al LePage. I'm in Counselor Semples Ward 1. This is my first time before the council, and I want to thank you for your work on behalf of people in Eugene. Also, thank you last year for the ordinance concerning fireworks in Eugene, essentially only allowing them on specific dates and banning fireworks south of West 18th. I recently attended a fire prevention program in Eugene to enhance my skills and knowledge as a volunteer preparedness presenter and have been discovering that the threat of fire with urban landowners and homeowners has become a, pun not intended, very hot issue in the last year or so. But I was also surprised to learn that last year's ordinance was not permanent and only good for 2018, so that's why I'm here tonight. As a resident that owns my home, I'm concerned about fireworks that could find their way into my yard and onto my roof and catch everything on fire. So I'm simply requesting the council to pass the same ordinance as last year and with the same ban on fireworks south of West 18th, in essence, to work with homeowners to help keep wildfire literally out of our backyards. Frankly, I'd like to see this ordinance become permanent, especially in light of climate change with ever-increasing warmer and warmer summer temperatures. Thank you all for your timely consideration in this regard, uh, and doing so before the upcoming 4th of July, um, actually as soon as possible, since I've already heard fireworks going off near my neighborhood just in the last week, and I checked the weather forecast, and for the next two weeks, there's not a drop of rain in it. So thank you again. I do have maps here of fire hazards in Eugene from the City of Eugene website and the ordinance you passed last year. Thank you again. Thank you. I can Kimberly Gladen. Take those and you? we'll make sure they get them. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Kimberly Gladen, followed by Lonnie Douglas. Hi, I'm Kimberly Gladen and I live in Ward 1. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit also about the courthouse. Um, I do feel for the people in the free speech plaza who can't have canopies, and I do think there should be some equity. Saturday Market and Farmer's Market each carry about $4 million in liability insurance in order to have those canopies. The canopy has to be fireproof, which that tarp costs about $200, and also I have to have a fire extinguisher there with me, which cost about $65, plus I have to get it recharged every year and inspected, which costs about $45 a year in order to do that. And I feel that if the people in the courthouse plaza meet the same requirements, they should be allowed to have canopies. You know, I, I pay for all those things out of my own pocket. Um, I'm not a rich person. I live in HUD housing. During Occupy, my income dropped to $4,000 below the poverty line. It's taken me a long time to come back up to that, and I've had to get a job in Springfield instead of Eugene in order to continue being able to work. Um, one of the things I did want to do and mention is to thank you for some of the changes over at the courthouse. It's made a huge difference. There have been no dog fights, no people fights, no overdoses. Um, the bathrooms have been much cleaner since then. Um, also, one of the big, big differences that's happened is that families are coming down. I have not had one tourist ask me what's wrong with our town after going over there accidentally and bringing their families over there and finding open drug use and open drug dealing. And I think over time, it'll make a big difference in our town to not attract drug dealers to our town or to not attract sexual predators to our town who can freely drug a teenager on the courthouse and walk away with them. Um, I want to say thank you for that change. It's been a lot nicer. Thank you. Lonnie Douglas, followed by Pamela Kraus. Howdy, my name is Lonnie Douglas. I'm a uh, volunteer with Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network. I'm in uh, Councilman Evans' uh, uh, ward. I gotta get used to the ward since I moved from Springfield over to here. 
Um, so ESSN has a 30 year history of fighting for economic and social justice for all workers. We believe that the Eugene payroll tax is a regressive tax that continues a pattern of shifting the tax burden throughout Oregon from the largest corporations to workers, homeowners, and small business owners. To that end, ESSN will stand in opposition to the Eugene payroll tax, and we are committed to collecting the signatures to refer it to the voters. Um, I do think uh, I'd like to address, I was here during the work session, uh, Councilman Clark, I think you're completely right. I think you guys should have referred it to the voters. Um, part of your job is to come up with good ideas, and I think that you did really try to come up with some good ideas. There's different reasons why different members of ESSN don't agree with this payroll tax. But uh, the other part of your job is to convince your constituents that your good ideas are good ideas. We're not gonna just take your word for it, and you're right, we don't have the time to spend, you know, a lot of people are working. They don't have the time to go through all this, uh, to, to, to come to all the meetings and watch all the stuff on uh, YouTube and all that sort of stuff. That's your job. Your job is to take and sell what you're doing just as much as it is to come up with it. So it would have been nice of you to refer to it. Um, we have a lot of allies, I think, that are probably willing to help us do this. We'll let the voters decide. Um, hopefully you guys, if you have a good idea, you'll be able to convince them. If you don't, then we need to come up with some other way of funding our uh, uh, police and our homeless shelters and stuff like that. I would recommend not taxing workers, but taxing corporations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Pamela Krause, followed by Tom Brandt. Good evening again. I'm Pamela Krause. I live in Springfield. I wanted to first of all thank the city of Eugene for co-sponsoring a, a very pleasant evening recently where we invited community into conversation. We need so many more conversations. We need less rules and less ordinances and less punishment. Here's a little quiz. What percentage of my income do you think I spend on rent? 69%. Now that my additional utilities are paid out of my own checkbook and not included in a basic rent check, did my cost of utility go down? No, it went up. Now that I pay more for electricity, did my EBT drop 25%? Yes. Having listened to a recent, this is kind of a collage. I'm like really burnt here. I don't know if I can live here much longer. Having listened to a recent interview on KLCC with the mayor about 5G, and I heard the mayor saying, people in the community are saying slow down on 5G, and the federal government is saying hurry up on 5G, basically. Who is the mayor accountable to? In the meantime, we need toilets and drinking fountains which appear magically for city events and then are taken away right afterwards. I find that pretty disgusting. There are people that have to use bathrooms and drink water all the time. What is the continuum of my mood and feelings recently in Eugene for about the last four months? Sadness and angst. Thank you. Um, Brant, followed by Mark. Um, if you had gone to the to last week's meetings of the River Road Corridor and the ODOT Delta Beltline Interchange Rebuild and the Envision Eugene meetings, you had noticed that there were no group meetings. It was all set up to divide people, not to let people talk. Um, at the first meeting for the corridor, the people were talking about, uh, well, people were talking about how these meetings are required for public input, but no public input was recorded. The officials halfway listened, 
but they don't hear people. They change the subject. An example, the last River Road meeting a month or so ago, there was a group presentation. When presenters talked about three-story apartment buildings on River Road, the people hissed and booed. The group did. They voiced their opinions about three stories were too much. They didn't want River Road turning into a Los Angeles high-rise corridor. They voiced their opinion about something green, something to save energy and keep the environment clean. At the meeting this week, this last week, there was no group meetings. The presenters had it set up with pictures and explanations on the easels around the room. On one setup, there were pictures and text of three-story buildings, and there were pictures and text of six and 10-story buildings. That was one of the changes that I saw. Exactly opposite of what the people voiced their opinion. They didn't have anything about solar. People talked about solar, but they didn't say one word about solar or conservation or anything. They have a plan and they're gonna do it no matter what the people say. Thank you. Next is Mark. I don't have a last name. Mark, is he still here? No, okay. Then we'll skip him. Mike Rose. Mike Rose. Yes, okay. And after Mike will be Peter Kowalki. Mike Rose, and I've been a citizen of Eugene since the early 60s. And I'd like to talk tonight about a wonderful addition to this community. That's the Shedd Institute for the Arts and, and the thousands of cultural experiences and educational experiences that organization provides the community. And in the process of growth and education the Shed Institute has looked at ways to build space. And then part of that is adding on to the building just west of the, the old Baptist church on Broadway. And that also has involved some negotiations about alley space. There's an alley that runs from the parking lot out into Broadway that if one were to study that, I think you would see that it's a dangerous situation, particularly with foot traffic, as well as the vehicles, possibilities. It also makes it more difficult to maintain security of the building and all the students in those buildings, day and night, it seems. Anyway, I would encourage the City Council to continue negotiations that will allow the Shed Institute for the Arts to take control of that space, take away the particular safety issues. And for me, it seems that unless there's a compelling reason for the city to keep that little chunk of empty space, that they should negotiate and allow the shed to use it. Thank you. Peter Kowalki, followed by Avery Temple. Pete Kowalke, College Hill area. Um, hi guys. You got a lot of stuff to work with there. Your plate's kind of full, huh? All right, well, <clears throat> I'm here because I want to talk about 5G a little bit. Um, and uh, as we know, we don't always get the truth from corporations and large organizations that have their own agenda. And, uh, and we also know that we're awash in stuff going through the air everywhere, this, this 2G, 3G, and 4G. And there has been, all you gotta do is search a little bit and you'll not say and you haven't, but you search a little bit and you'll see uh, <clears throat> even experiments with 4G where they had uh, sprouts growing. I used to be a sprouter and that was one of my businesses. So they had sprouts growing and then uh, that they're trying to s sprout seeds and then some other ones that they had right next to a router, 4G, and obviously I'm bringing it up because 
these didn't grow. Okay, so that's just the 4G. All right, so if we do a little bit of studying about it, uh, you'll see that 5G is really being pushed and it's just, it's not safe, believe me. Do a little study and here's, I'll just read this one thing here, because uh, there's over 180 scientists and doctors <clears throat> from 36 countries warn about the danger of 5G, uh, which of course leads to the massive increase of, of electromagnetic uh, radiation. And uh, these scientists got together, you might know about this already, and urged the EU, the European Union, to follow Resolution 1815 of the Council of Europe, asking for an independent task force to reassess the health effects. And I'll read it real quick here. It says, we the undersigned scientists recommend a moratorium on the rollout, oh, of the fifth generation, it goes on and on, but that's what they, these are 180 scientists, so. Thank Thank, you. Thanks so much. Check in. Thank you. Avery Temple, followed by Catherine uh, Janin. Hi, my name is Avery Temple. Thanks for holding this forum today. Um, I have several concerns with the proposal um, for the increase of, in funding for the Eugene Police Department and the lack of funding increase in prevention and unhoused resources. My first and foremost concern with this proposal is the lack of funding going towards critical resources such as CAHOOTS, an organization in Eugene that uses de-escalation tactics and medical care to have a profound and positive impact on the community. Where is the funding for these resources and others like them that do more direct and indirect good for the community? I know I'm not alone when I say that there is a greater need for the unhoused prevention and unhoused services, especially for unhoused youth, than for a larger police force. Addressing the root cause of our issues, like the unhoused population and addiction, would make the community safer in the short and long term. Another concern of mine is the blatant disregard for the safety of people of color with this proposal, considering that none of the funding is going towards necessary police training on racism, bias, discrimination, or de-escalation. It's unfair to expect a large portion of this funding to come from taxpayers who don't want it in the first place. So I'll leave with the remaining questions that the public deserves to have answered. One, where is the need for the, this increase as opposed to other more critical resources? Two, where is the proof of, the, of that need and the proof of the proposal's effectiveness? And three, if you feel like the measure won't pass if it was referred to the public, then why should it be passed at all? Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final speaker is Catherine, and I think it says Janin, but you can correct me. Yeah, um, my name is Catherine Jansen. I'm from Ward 1 um, with Councilperson Emily Semple. Um, I just wanted to respond to all the discussion around public safety and law enforcement I keep hearing. And I also want to start off by saying that I am completely in support of fair law enforcement, but I do not support the payroll tax. And I'm worried about these kinds of conversations um, happening. And I think our city's most important safety issues, safety issues are not going to be mitigated by police presence, by an increase of police presence. Um, since we're talking about um, public safety, I wanted to say that I do feel unsafe walking around um, Eugene, especially alone at night. Um, I feel unsafe having to wade through people with nowhere else to go on the street corners, and I feel unsafe being approached by people um, on drugs in downtown. Um, but police are not going to be solving these issues, um, and police harassing homeless people um, on the street corners are not going to be solving these issues. Um, this is a problem that's not going to go away, no matter how many times we talk about public safety and an increase of law enforcement. Um, we need more resources for houseless people and houseless services and addiction support. Um, and there are dozens of really wonderful organizations in town struggling to support our residents, and we need to be supporting them and supporting really good organizations like CAHOOTS. Um, so if we really care about public safety, um, please listen to our residents and support houseless support um, and addiction. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our final speaker. Are there counselors who wish to comment on things they've heard? Councilor Syrett, Councilor Semple. Anybody else in the queue? All right, take it away. Council Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, everyone who came to speak. I know a number of people left already. I'm not going to respond to every single topic, but just wanted to hit a couple of things. Um, so uh, in our newest budget that uh, we'll be adopting uh, later, I think, in July, maybe June. 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 Thank you. 
Uh, we increased funding to CAHOOTS by uh, $281,000 to increase the number of hours that they operate, and we've increased funding to CAHOOTS, I believe, in the last two budgets before that. And city manager, I don't know if you know off the top of your head how much of our funding is going to CAHOOTS. Uh, I do. It's a uh, little over $1.1 million per year if the budget um, in later this month is approved, and that's an ongoing source, and so that's money that will continue to be in the budget in subsequent years. Thank you. So I just want folks to know that we ext uh, value extremely CAHOOTS service, and we've recognized them, and they've stepped up and expanded their services uh, in response to the additional funding. And I do believe that our police are... Uh, do receive de-escalation training as part of their training. Um, and then I wanted to ask about the fireworks ordinance. So we did pass, I believe, some permanent changes to our fireworks usage, and I wonder if anyone's able to remind us of what that was. I can. Thank you. Um, so in 2018, you did pass an ordinance. It was in May of 2018. You passed an ordinance um, that is permanent. It does not sunset. And it um, is the it limited the times that uh, fireworks could be detonated. So um, consumer fireworks anywhere in the city are prohibited except for December 31st, January 1st, July 3rd, and July 4th. Um, and then display fireworks were um, limited to July 3rd through 5th unless explicitly authorized otherwise. So those were the changes that were made in 18. The reference that was made to the prohibition in the certain area, that was a um, emergency declaration that was made that one time. It was made by motion. It wasn't um, a code amendment. Um, so that was separate. Uh, that was done a few years ago. And didn't we also uh, limit the types of fireworks that could be sold? That ultimately did not pass. Ah, something I wanted to pass and didn't pass. Okay. Um, and then on the payroll tax, uh, you know, we did make significant changes to that at our work session before we passed it, and we exempted minimum wage workers completely from paying the payroll tax, and we uh, reduced, uh, again, from what had been, uh, would be paid by most employees, reduced the rate for anyone earning below $15 an hour. So I feel that we made significant changes in order to, uh, take the burden off of our minimum wage workers, and I think it makes it difficult to argue that it unfairly uh, targets or burdens low-income workers because of those changes we made. It's not perfect, um, but we did um, try to be responsive to that particular critique of the payroll tax. Thanks. Okay, that's our sample. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who came and spoke, and thank you for pointing out that CAHOOTS is included. I, I think that's important an important misconception that uh, certain services aren't included in this. And we're going, I hope so, because I told people to, um, do a better job, a, a more thorough job of showing where the dollars would be going. We don't have, you know, the perfect plan exactly to the cent. But um, show people, educate people more of, of the cahoots is in there and, and other services. So it may be um, a fuller package than people realize. And I want to address the vending at free speech. It's been two months since Saturday market opened and we're still working on this. It's being promoted as it can still be tweaked. Um, Yes, umbrellas, no umbrellas. It's been back and forth. Right now you can have a, up to a six-foot personal umbrella, which I think is like a rain umbrella, um, and attached to your table. So if the wind comes up, maybe your whole table will fall over. Um, for a while, people were open to the idea of market umbrellas, those larger canvas umbrellas. Uh, the city uses them on the parks, and Saturday Market and Farmer's Market both use them. Um, I thought they would be less dangerous because you can take it down in one motion, unlike um, a canopy. They'd be really cute, all the colors. Um, you could see through them, open air market. Uh, and the vendors seem to like that idea as a compromise. Um, being able to pay $50 to have a canopy is, is brand new news to me. And uh, it brings up all kinds of equity issues I don't even want to think about. Um, 
So I'm hoping that we can continue to work on this, this shade issue. Another thing that concerns me about the vending in free speech is all the people who have left. And yes, the people who were selling drugs and having dog fights, we're all glad that they aren't doing that there anymore. But there are a lot of vendors um, who just aren't there, in part because of the space taken up by the sidewalk, and in part because uh, the canopy issue, in part because of the having to pay for the permit. But there's people we're leaving out who might only want to come for two or four hours, you know, once, twice, three times a month. They can't pay the $25. This is my quick picture. A mother and her daughter spend, young daughter spend a couple hours Friday making bracelets. They come down Saturday to sell them, visit friends for a couple hours. They do this twice a month. They split the money between ice cream and the public safety tax. They can't do this anymore. We're cutting out everybody who doesn't have $25 and wants to not be at Saturday market because they can't do that much. So we still need tweaking. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, that closes the public forum. Um, I am going to propose that we take a break and let the room clear of folks for the public forum come back. We have a public hearing and then other council business to do, so I'm going to give everybody a 10-minute chance to stretch, run upstairs, do whatever you need to do. Folks who are ready to leave can just leave, and we'll be back in uh, at about eight minutes past nine.
It's solar. It's brighter. Good evening. I invite you all back into the room and find another warm seat to sit in and uh, welcome back. We are now ready to move into council business. We get one quick piece of business and then we'll go into the public hearing. So the first item is the consent calendar. I move to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, that passes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and now we are ready for a public hearing. Uh, an ordinance concerning persons in charge of planting strips and amending section 7.370 of the Eugene Code 1971. Um, manager, do you want to speak to this first? Just real briefly. The proposed ordinance is in response to a couple of councillors wanting to clarify that the property owner responsible for maintaining the space between the curb and the sidewalk, commonly referred to as a planting strip, is the person in charge of the planting strip for purposes of uh, Eugene Code 4.807, which is trespassing. Thank you. So I will just remind everybody of the rules. Those wishing to speak during the public hearing must submit a completed request to speak form to the information desk prior to the beginning of the public hearing. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward, if known. You will have three minutes to comment. There are lights on the timer. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. We have. <coughs> 24 speakers, so again, I'll call two names, first name up at the mic, and the second name uh, person can be in the chair, so we move uh, expeditiously. First up is Chris Gadsby, followed by Pete Knox. Hello, city officials. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I really do appreciate the public comment. I hope it will continue and that people will respect it for what it is. Thank you again. I am Chris Gatsby. I live in Claire Surrett's Ward, Ward 7. Uh, I am the chair of the Whitaker Community Council, and I am here to speak as the chair and also as a person who lives there. Um, there's no way for us to arrest ourselves out of this situation, but there is no way to continue to accept people living in the median strips as viable. It's It's... It is a terrible place for people to be able to survive. There's no bathrooms. There's no place for them to wash their hands. There is just a total lack of dignity. The other part of this is living in the Whitaker, we seem to see an increased number of individuals because they have no place else to go. The median strip is not a good place for anyone to go to live. That being said, with the exclusion of the median strips for people to live in, it is up to us as community and also city officials to find a place for them to stay. Everyone needs a place to live. But like I said, one, I, I wanna make this clear, the median strip is not a good place for people to live. It prohibits businesses from flourishing. The gentlemen at the Red Apple have expressed to me that having all of the people camping in front of there has diminished business and there's a huge increase in theft not directly related to that, but you can see the correlation that you have. What I would like to say is in the Whitaker, we are inundated with services. We have over 700 people that are eating at the mission and we have no place for them to go. We have no place for them to go to the bathroom, which thankfully our city manager had a quick response and allocated three toilets. Two of them have ceased to exist because of incredibly bad behavior. That's not to say that all of the people who are working within the community council haven't assisted and tried to manage these areas. It's beyond us. But right now, I, as Chris Gadsby, and the chair of the community council say, living in those median strips just denies people their dignity. So it is up to us to find a place for them to live, but it is not in the median strips at all. My position as a community council chair is pretty rough sometimes. I was called a bootlicking fascist and um, um, among other things. But as a person who lives there, I am just trying to say we can do better. And I think that we will with all of your help. So thank you very much. Thank you. Pete Knox, 
Followed by John Thielking. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council and uh, City Manager. My name is Pete Knox. I'm a uh, resident of Ward 1, Emily Simple's Ward. And I'm also the Vice Chair of the Downtown Neighborhood Association. And I have to admit, my uh, uh, fellow neighborhood representative uh, from Whitaker, uh, uh, a tough act to follow. So I am not going to not going to cover exactly the same ground he did. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in downtown and West University for the last um, well, basically 10 years or so. And, you know, one of the things that uh, it's frustrating because there is, is there's activity that goes on in the median strip. The uh, city requires the property owners, which oftentimes falls to the renters, if they're they are renters, to maintain that that area. And if you're asking us to be responsible for that area, and don't give us tools to to try to deal with that, then how how can we be successful in maintaining that that space and ma and making it safe? for people to walk by our houses and our apartments to make it uh, a viable place for to be to not have trash and and uh, other debris that that you know is unsightly and th those kind of things you know people talk about uh, cell towers reducing their property values well trash and and broken garbage and stuff that they, you just can't keep up with, we'll do the same thing. So I, I urge you guys to pass this um, and to, to just reiterate what he said. I also urge you guys to continue down the road of trying to deal with the homeless situation and and the report that had get came out uh, and that you guys are going to be ta tackling later this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. John Thiel King, followed by Charmaine Rigg. I'm John Thilking from Ward 1. I'm opposed to potentially increasing the penalties for camping on the strips of grass between the sidewalk and the curb. Currently, these strips of land are in a regulatory no-person's land where the owners of the properties adjacent to the strips are responsible for maintaining them and are somewhat restricted in the types of si and sizes of so-called landscaping that they can place there, but they have no other property rights over those strips. Currently, these strips are not part of the parcels they purchased when they acquired their properties. I filed a nuisance complaint in February 2019 about the large rocks that have been placed on the strips that near the intersections of 2nd and Washington and also 2nd and Lawrence. I checked upon the status of my complaint today and was told it was a public works issue and not a code enforcement issue. So I had someone from the public works make a copy of the complaint form that I had filed. They said that they would share it with their team and get back to me. I was told by the public works person that so-called landscaping is allowed on these strips as long as it's 18 inches in height or less. This contradicts what I was told in February, which is the limit is 12 inches in size, which the large rocks are grossly exceeding. Plus, they just look ugly, worse than looking at a row of tents with a few spots of litter in between. I know I have schizophrenia, so I am slightly prone to construct conspiracy theories out of strings of unlucky coincidences. So when the first city manager, when first the city manager changed the downtown activity zone rules right after I started up my idea of letting the unhoused people sell my Calcosing art cars downtown, and now that my friends and I are working on to preserve camping opportunities along the strips of land between the sidewalk and the curb, I started to think that maybe the city council will come up with these ideas as a way of banning the types of activities, the activities that my friends and I want to engage in, to make the city more livable and give everyone a fair shake at having at least some place to rest. So now my thoughts turn to the following idea, which I actually and just hope the city council will find a way to ban or severely restrict. I may plan to reserve a spot in Alton Baker Park during August or September 2019 for an event they will be calling Yuppies in the Park. I will restrict access to the shelter where the event is held and encourage people to show up dressed well and they must prove that they have $100 on them in order to be admitted. The $100 worth of currency can be in any form or of monetization, pesos, dollars, euros, crypto balance on your wallet, on your smartphone wallet, or even play money like Monopoly money. But you must be in possession of $100 to gain admission. 
Donations of real money will be accepted at the event that will be given and distributed through my free website projects, bstickers.net, cowtoasting.org, and the bus station. Thank you. Charmaine, uh, I think it's bit Rig. Rig, followed by Bill O'Brien. Hi, my name is Charmaine Rigg. I'm in Mike Clark's ward. Um, I don't think I need the whole three minutes. I just think it's a, a great idea if the businesses take over the spaces in front. Um, they can make it look pretty. They can put in some more flower boxes, or they can just plain keep it clean. Uh, I want to have access along the <coughs> sidewalks or cutting over. Or however, I, I want to have full access other than, let's say, if there's some planter boxes, which what a great aesthetic. Already the downtown uh, flowers have looked more beautiful in the last couple years than any time since I moved here a few years ago. Um, I just want to say about people camping or lying on the sidewalks. I saw uh, when I was on Greenway Bridge on my bike last summer, there were two visitors from Belgium, a woman and her mom. They had rented those blue bikes, Peace Health bikes, and they said to me, they're like, why do you allow this? Why do you let people just lie on the streets? It's really embarrassing. Um, it's inexcusable. Uh, Camp or Dawn to Dawn is still operating on 99. There's a lot of services. There's no point to just lie around downtown, in tents or not in tents, uh, on the sidewalks. And then people went in and use Starbucks bathroom, I guess. I can't believe that two of those probably young kids work in there. Now I've got needle sticks. That's inexcusable. I'm a retired nurse. They're going to have to go now for endless months. Their baseline HIV and all the hepatitis uh, and then go back again and again and again. This is wrong. Um, also, EPD has verified to me that many of these people are coming in from other places. And I can tell you that, that is, I know that that is true from having been uh, stopping my nursing for a while, I became a bus driver and was told the same thing when I would, lived elsewhere on the West Coast about people coming into the West Coast because of better weather and all the freebies. And that is a quote. Um, and then the last thing, you guys are trying to make the city look good for the 2021 International Track Meet. We're trying to get that riverfront park done and the murals. Uh, great. Now, I love it, all, all the events and making it look pretty. And we certainly foot the bill for everything which, with our two high property taxes. Um, but that'll be undone when people are lying on the streets. It undoes it all. Thank you. You're welcome. Bill O'Brien, followed by Leslie Noxon. Yeah, I live in Eugene. I'm a registered voter. Um, um, I, I, I've noticed that I've seen a lot of, um, you know, antisocial behavior, violence. You know, I saw a letter in the Register Guard about men threatened being very overt physical threats, whatever. And I, I see that uptick, um, and I, I, I just think people are more desperate. And on the other hand, the other extreme, I walk around the university, and I don't want to sound like a racist, or, but I see people from China, 20-year-old kids, you know, driving these incredibly, like, Lexuses and things like that, you know? I mean, it's just, it's a little surreal. And, um, uh, but... Um, what I really, I don't see a real answer to this problem. Like, I have friends at South Lane Mental Health in Cottage Grove, and, you know, I just uh, observed my friend, some of the people living around them, I, s I said, these guys look pretty bad. I said, and he, he told me, well, they're meth addicts. I said, well, great. One guy doesn't even live there, you know, and, um, you know, so... I know there's a bit, there's a movement, and I totally support this movement of stabilizing people in housing, you know, like the uh, Boston uh, consulting firm that you had recently, and that was great. Uh, and they really need to do that, and but the money, and um, I kind of wish maybe, beside your um, 
I know you having this proposed tax on development, but I just kind of wish you would have like a caveat saying to some people, you know, we have a desperate situation and we need some donations like St. Vincent de Paul or whatever and generate more money then. We've got to really say it on the ballot language. But um, frankly, um, I find it really disturbing, you know, like I, I get bummed out seeing people in, in various throes of addiction and whatnot. Um, you know, it, it bothers me to no end. And it, I depersonalize people at times. Sometimes I depersonalize masses of people, and it's not good. Um, but frankly, you know, I look at down there in f between 5th and 4th and High Street, and I thought that was a stunt by the city, putting all those rocks there in the, the planter space. I mean, it, but I, it seems like that's from Brian Ovi. I mean, you can just dump these rocks, and you can dump debris, maybe stickers, whatever, and the people got to, so they move out. You know, they're just going to move somewhere else. I don't see any, despite all this, even when we get housing for everybody, I don't see the meth crisis going away, the heroin crisis. Uh, maybe, maybe slow evolution, we can have some more civil lesson in civics that we all can learn from. But I don't see it. I don't see it, you know, when I see these Asian, you know, excuse me, I don't want to sound bad, but these 20-year-old kids riding around in these cars. And... You know, they'll stream all these addicts and all these business you. people. You know, you're, they're going to make money no matter Thank what. Thank you. Leslie Noxon, followed by Richard Inlove. Do I press a button? Mm -mm. Okay. Just work. I really appreciate you guys. I don't know how you do it. I would have a migraine, I am telling you. <laughs> and I appreciate the police. I do think they're wonderful. And most of the people I talk to on a day-to-day -day basis think they're wonderful. Um, my assorted thoughts about the planning strips are I really don't want people to be allowed to live on planning strips. The homelessness situation bewilders me. I keep studying it. I've been reading uh, Christopher Rufo, who's a documentarian for uh, PBS. He talks about Seattle under siege. Seattle's dying. I read, is it called the TAC report or the TAC report? The TAC report. So according to our own advisors, our county advisors, we're getting 130 new homeless people a month coming into the system here, and I think a lot of them are from out of town. So we, we tend to kind of call and draw homeless people to us. Hey, I've got a big heart, too. I'm a nurse. I've got five kids. These people need shelter. I know that. But um, most of them come to the Whitaker. I have property in the Whitaker, and the Whitaker neighborhood is unbelievably patient and sweet with the tweakers and uh, their mailboxes being robbed. And, um, uh, you know, and still they'll advocate for the homeless, but I think it's, I think it's not compassionate to advocate that homeless people sleep in the strips and that they come to the Whitaker and so forth. And here's why I say that. Compassion to me is invented so that we're kind to our families and that we're kind to our neighbors and our coworkers and our, uh, our immediate community. Embracing the homeless to come and squat in a neighborhood is not compassion, it's something else, it's advocacy and I worry about the needles and the feces and the trash that's left behind. Um, Whitaker has to pick up a hell of a lot of it on a daily basis. So I urge you to allow uh, the owners of the planter strips to be able to um, have some control over who sleeps there. And thank you very much. Thank you. Rich in love, followed by Susan Selig. I'm back. <laughs> um, I want to, uh, Rich in Love, uh, District se uh, 7? Yes, Claire. I think there's something, part of what's going on with the, I'm in the Whitaker, so one of the things that's going on, and I've seen it a lot, is this resentment against a certain element of the people who are living outside on the uh, grass strips. The amount of because the signage is put up and then they have to move, but it's amazing how the city has to come in and clean up all this trash. And I wonder for the people who are advocating for the homeless, 
are having conversations with them saying, you know what, you are creating a situation that's not helping your, your cause because there's resentment being built by you just uh, being created by the amount of trash that you're leaving behind. Are those people who are advocating for the homeless having those kind of conversations with them? And also, are we distinguishing, making a distinction between those people who like find out why they're homeless and trying to help them and saying it's kind of like a situation where this person, we can help them. They, they can, if we can get them in a certain situation, they can uh, be in a way that's responsible and, and they're of a different kind of homelessness, different levels of homelessness, mental, illness, and also if you catch them early, because if they become homeless, then it's just, I think that it's been shown that it's a spiral that goes down. The mental illness starts to increase, which impacts our health care, which we're all paying for. So if we can intervene in certain ways that are effective, I think that will, and one of the ways is, hey, why are you homeless? And the people who, before they become homeless, saying, Here's your options. You can, like I said before, you can get a motor home. We're going to have a place for you to have your motor home. Or maybe in a neighborhood where they're, they're, people are tolerant because they see that you're being responsible as far as you want home. You're also homeless, but you're of a different levels of homelessness. So I hope that that will, you know, this will all be given thought. And perhaps we can come up with something where we can be effective and working together. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Selig. Followed by Irene Altucker. We live in Ward 5, which is Mike Clark's district. Evidently, I've got a revelation for the people in Whittaker. The problem is not just in the Whittaker. It is citywide. People who own commercial and residential property, and we are one of them, every day deal with bodily excrement, trash, drug paraphernalia, and vandalism. It is also an ongoing problem for all the small businesses in the city who pay the taxes, that provide all the other services. Everyone we know complains about how their businesses are impacted terribly by the, the fear that people have of coming downtown or out in the warehouse district or anywhere else. We are no longer a safe city. Families with children can't go to our parks. Somehow, our compassion and, carry <coughs> and caring for all these people has come back to bite us. And we have become a city of enablers. If you've, if you've seen the YouTube video on Seattle is Dying, I think that has one of the major points in there is it's not an issue of homelessness. It's an issue of substance abuse. So we have to somehow find a way to return our city to the people who've lived here for many years and paid property taxes for many years. I think one start would be to allow the property owners who are responsible and liable for the parking strip to be able to call the police and expect squatters to be removed. We are absolutely in support of this new ordinance, citywide. The other issue is, it's costing the city, I think, close to a million dollars to clean up after all these problems all over the city. Think what that extra million dollars could do for the city. So we hope that you will go forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Irene Altucker, followed by James, J Jamie Hensley. James. Good evening. Irene Altucker, Ward 3. I um, would like to just briefly say that I am here in support of the ordinance. Uh, having the property owners that are responsible for the parking planting strip be able to um, take care of it. And by taking care of it, make sure that um, it is always uh, uh, able to have the public walk over it, 
walk through it. Um, it's concerning from a public health issue what goes on when the property owners are not able to take care of the parking strip. So I'm here and encouraging all of you to vote in support of the parking strip ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Hensley, you'll have to correct me if I'm not reading this properly. Followed by Zandi Zinke. Hi, my name is Jamie Hensley and I'm from Eugene and I am in support of the ordinance and I work downtown and walk through downtown every day and enjoy it. So please make sure that our landowners and our business owners are able to take care of that land. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sandy Zinke, followed by Jerry Glass. You can't say that nobody's saying, oh, it's compassionate to let people sleep in planting strips. The point is we don't want vulnerable people further criminalized, right? I read you the list. Criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass. That is people with nowhere to go. Last weekend, I had the people that had been camping in my side yard. I live on a substandard size lot, small. The people had been camping in my kids' play structure. I told them I use it for daycare in the summer. They'd been there since Camp 99 closed. I need you to go. They worked really hard to dispose of all their garbage that had accumulated because you know what? There's never anywhere for them to dispose of their garbage, right? So you can provide toilets. You can, I grew up in New York City. In the rich neighborhood, there's a trash can in, on every corner. You went up to Harlem, trash cans disappeared, right? And then there's litter on the streets. Not like that in Harlem anymore. It's gentrified. The, so we are talking about further criminalization, not solving the problem. So you want that list I read that was one day's docket of community court. You want the docket of municipal court and community court to sound like that, but doubled or tripled? Nice, right? So what you can do is not pass the weakest CET ever, right? <clears throat> but pass a robust one, right? But actually, it's all a joke. The TAC report, a 75-bed shelter, that's going to do jack. 350 units of support, permanent supportive housing, that's going to do jack. Somebody every two hours in Lane County becomes homeless. Okay, it went up 33%. The count, the official count, which is nowhere near the real numbers, went up 33% in just the last year. So what are you going to do? None of the plans will suffice. Right? You have to get real and start listening to Todd Boyle, who has a real, you know, when he talks about housing and enabling people to have shelter, what we have now is saying, you know what, you want to plant a seed in the ground and grow your own lettuce? Well, the permit is $250,000. You got to get a $250,000 permit because that's what it costs to, be, to build a permittable house. Well, not everyone needs this permittable house, right? A right to survive has to come first. And what you're doing instead is criminalizing, criminalizing, criminalizing. And you know what? You can represent the people who are voiceless here and say to the neighborhood association people, you know what? OK, you want us to enact this? Well, you know what? We're going to negotiate with you. Identify places where we can open safe spots. Identify them now, and we'll do an exchange. But you don't re represent the people, the most vulnerable people, right, who are trying to survive and negotiate hardcore for them. No, it's like, oh, we got to do it. We got to do it. Thank you. Jerry Glass, followed by Eric Jackson. I know it's easy for um, some of you people who have houses to, um, you, you have no idea what it is to be like to be homeless. You know, and um, I do not recommend anybody, uh, I don't condone the trash on the streets. You know, and um, the, the housing systems are not gonna work. You know, we did try to like offer you guys a solution and then you guys handed it to St. Vincent de Paul. It was a horrible decision. I'm not gonna go sit over there in a place where I have my things thrown away because I left to go to lunch. You know, I'm, I can rail all I want to, you know, and be mad or whatever, but you know what, the problem's not gonna be solved because if you do take away the, um, 
the chance on the side block, on the side of the way, then you're still there's still people there. You can't put us all in jail. And I promise you, I will organize people. You know, one way or the other, I'd rather do it responsibly and respectfully. You know, Eric Jackson is a good friend of mine, and I think he has a good he, I think he has a good head on his shoulders. And you guys, we sat in this council here, and you guys told us that you guys would help us out, and then you gave the statement to Paul. And I knew it was fail the moment that I said the head of the organization goes. We need to deal with the homeless population as cheap and efficiently as possible. And I told this guy to go over there and charge his cell phone. I had to tell the guy seven times what I meant, and he still didn't get it because he did not understand what homeless people would go through. And he, and he was, what do you call it? I mean, he, he has no idea. You know what I mean? And, and I'm willing to work with people. I really am. But this time, I want you to keep a promise. If you don't, I will get militant. I will protect my people by any means necessary. But I am also a reasonable person willing to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Jackson, followed by Michael Kerrigan. City Council, Mayor, John. <clears throat> a court not of record is a place where shenanigans can take place. A court not of record is a place where your public defender assigned to you in everything you heard Zondi rattled down in community court. Each one of those individuals is represented by an attorney before they walk in the door. The $384 is spent on their public defender before they get there. They don't have to fill out a piece of paper by virtue of them being given the ticket and directed to community court, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, criminal trespass, open container, open container, open container, criminal trespass. They're given an attorney prior to arraignment, prior to pleading guilty or not guilty. And the community court is also a court not of record. Do you know what I call a court not of record now that I've realized what it is? It's not an administrative court. It's not a justice court. It's a tinker toy court. It's a joke. It's a place where not a single public defender can be held accountable for inadequate counsel. It's a place where every single time that somebody pleads no contest in community court because their public defender suggests that they do so and then attend drug and alcohol classes when they didn't have a drug and alcohol problem. One of the young ladies that is the Saturday market complainer explained to me outside that she got a criminal trespass too for drawing on a pad behind Lazar's. And they made her plead no contest and take eight weeks of whatever diversion, including drug and alcohol diversion, which she didn't have a problem with. That seems like you're investing money in something that doesn't need to be invested in. Criminal trespass, is that just indentured servitude? Because that's all it seems like to me. You're giving tickets to people that can't afford the $250 ticket, $280, $180 ticket. Um, and with that, those individuals then get put into servitude. They're indentured servants. All the tickets that I have, the judge wanted to replace with some sort of community service based on one being in collections. Don't think that that's reasonable. Closing the sidewalk area, if you guys would tell the police to stop telling public works when somebody responsible calls and says, can you pick up the 15 bags of trash that I have here? And they say, we're not allowed because the police won't let us. If there's still campers there, we're not allowed to pick up your trash, Eric. Interesting, the thing that people complain most about, the trash. Reason that it's there is because they're not allowed to pick it up. Thank you. Michael Kerrigan. Michael still here? Did he give up? Okay. Tiffany Edwards, followed by Janet A.
Good evening, Mayor Venice and members of council. My name is Tiffany Edwards of Ward 5, and I'm the Director of Business Advocacy for the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce. Our local government affairs council voted unanimously to support a revision that would allow property owners to maintain control of their planting strips for which they're responsible to maintain for several reasons. There is currently a lack of clarity as to which property is public, which is private, and which areas need to make remain clear for pedestrian use. So by allowing the property owner the authority to maintain this entire planting strip area, it provides that certainty. These areas are designated to provide a safe space between sidewalks and streets while allowing for landscaping and a safe line of sight. Occupying these spaces provides a safety hazard for pedestrians, cyclists, motor vehicles, and other transportation users by obstructing their vision. And if a property owner is required to maintain these areas to ensure adequate safety without the ability to ensure these areas be kept clear of anything that might be an obstruction, they're not able to provide adequate maintenance or ensure safety in these areas. This revised ordinance will serve as a tool for law enforcement to help support these efforts to keep people safe. Councilors, you are hearing this issue tonight as a divisive one being debated as a target to our unhoused population. Our chamber businesses and members are some of the most dedicated and compassion, compassionate among us in addressing the needs of our most vulnerable citizens. We support community-wide efforts to provide resources, dedicate a tremendous amount of time working towards solutions to homelessness, and have weighed in in bold ways to support making sizable community investments for low-income housing, community justice, and including homelessness and preventative services, shelter, and other needed resources. Failure to acknowledge or recognize the dedication of our hardworking members of our business community and of our organization is discouraging and disingenuous. On behalf of our members, we ask for your support for this ordinance and for your continued partnership in providing more tools and more opportunities for collaborative solutions and in addressing our housing and homelessness crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Janet A, followed by Michael Gannon. Well, I spoke earlier about the two class system and just to assure or to convince you that I'm not hypocritical in my view, that's the broader picture. But locally, I'm going to talk to you about the local issue. Many years ago, I knew a person that was quite vexing with me because uh, that person seemed to be non-committal in being a person. I sought advice on why this person seemed distant, almost angry. And the person I sought the advice from remarked to me, that sometimes there are people that like their toys to stay broken because they don't like to share. I'm hoping the city council does not adopt this attitude in denying property owners the opportunity to have some say with what happens to their property. People like myself, although I empathize with their broader picture of how folks get to this point and become angry, disenfranchised, accusatory, um, cannot accept the responsibility in part. And I realize there's a fraction of them that don't have the mind to do what most of us can, can do. Um, I'm asking that the city council not only pass this ordinance so that I as a property owner can keep it from being coming um, bubonic plague or whatever. I uh, have little heart to empathize with folks that have trashed our beautiful city. My dad, many years ago, brought us out from South Carolina, and he called this the Emerald City. It's a gorgeous city. And it is becoming an absolute eyesore. Please don't let Eugene become another Seattle or San Francisco. We have much uh, better people here, I think, that will stand up to that. So 
I applaud and I would like to encourage you to include the parking area. I live in the Whitaker. I have an investment property and I actually have to turn my garbage cans upside down to keep these dilapidated, non-roadworthy vehicles from parking and trashing up the street or doing oddball things. There are people that are anarchists and I think our city has attracted uh, uh, several of those folks here and it's and I don't feel as though that they're as vulnerable as a property owner as I am thank you thank you Michael Gannon followed by Cherie Straussball good evening council I'm happy to be here I hope you are I appreciate you being here and listening but I don't see much in the way of results, so I, it's hard for me to be truly appreciative. Because it seems like it's a very com a bunch of complex problems are being um, funneled together into this proposal that um, people should have control over the public property that's in front of their house between the sidewalk and the street. And I think it's necessary for us to try to get a better grip on where we are in Eugene in 2019, the beginning of the 21st century. We don't have any proposals in Congress to pass another Homestead Act. And when the Homestead Act was passed and had such an <clears throat> extraordinary um, effect on the economy of the nation, the settling of the lands in the West. But the government didn't um, try to de detect who were the heroin users that were trying to get 160 acres. They didn't try to detect who are the racists that wanted 160 acres. And we know that those 160 acre plots no longer exist. And we know that there are billions of people on the planet, a greater number of people than I would have thought possible. So <clears throat> I see us largely in Eugene trying to tamp down something that we don't understand that we don't like and that we don't want. But the Ninth Circuit Court for the seven Western states has declared that when there is not enough public shelter, or shelter, not public shelter, but just enough shelter in a community, then people are entitled to sleep and exist on public property. So, I fully expect the federal government, the Ninth Circuit Court, to issue orders to Eugene to provide opportunities for people to sleep in public, on public property. And you're going to have to give back the control of the strip of land to that change that's going to be required. It's amazing that three minutes has gone by and it's sort of complex and we still haven't addressed Thank the problem you. and I don't see us really having the dialogue about it. Thank you, Michael. Cherie Straussball, followed by Kimberly Gladen. Thank you all for listening to us. Um, I am a business owner and a property owner down near the Whitaker district. And I am, I have been so grateful and thankful for what has happened in that area over the last five years, except this last year. There's been such a change with everything that's coming in. That property, the planting strip around our property, <laughs> we've maintained it for 60 years. I guess I'm in, in the dark here because we've always maintained it and make it beautiful. Um, what has happened? 
this is a compassionate, loving city. And there is more people. We take care of families, the, the nonprofits, the people. I'm proud to live here and proud to have a business in here. We have a thriving business. We have people, 30 to 60 people that come in and out of our business every day, driving in and out. And I experience something this last week in the last 48 hours that five campers, not families, um, I want to thank, I want to thank the police. I do. I want to thank because what the, between the trash and they're gone now. I actually interacted with them today and no one could speak to me because they were so drugged and so stoned and they were totally, no one was, no one could speak to me. But they understood that we were running a business and they couldn't stay there. They moved out, took them all day. When I left the business today, this afternoon at 5.30, there were so many needles. There were so many needles and I don't, now I don't know what to do. I've got people coming, I've got customers. We have a business that we pay a lot of taxes. We support everything here. And um, I am for taking care of the, the planting, you know, not us as owners and having the say in that. Um, I am also for helping those people in some way. But I don't believe it's for having them camp out on the, the planting area. There's got to be a better way, and um, I don't have the solution. All right, thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Gladen, <laughs> followed by Rebecca Meadows. Hi, I'm Kimberly, and I'm in Ward 1, and I... I'm in favor of the homeowners having control over that planting strip. I've seen some people have done some really beautiful things with it. Um, I don't think that they should have to deal with the needles and the trash. I've seen some camps on those strips that have spilled out into the street, covered the sidewalk, made it difficult for people to get to their homes, into their homes, where they've had their children have to deal with needles and a lot of drug use. Um, even just this last winter, when there was the camp on the butterfly, there was a portage on directly across the street, and it wasn't used. Instead, there was a lot of feces left over on the butterfly. There was a lot of trash. There was a lot of needles. I see it daily in the downtown that trash is left behind even just a few inches from a trash can, where it's not even bother using it. There are at least 20 trash cans at the bus station. And before you, the planters were put there and the restrictions at the bus station were put into effect, daily the kids left mounds of trash instead of walking it over to a trash can. Um, I feel that the homeowners, for the safety of the community, need to have some control. Um, we need to do better for the homeless, but we need a national program other states are dumping their homeless on our community. And unless all of you are willing to give your money up down to my income level to support the kind of shelters we need and the programs we need to take care of the nation's homeless here in Eugene, then I think you gotta start going after the other states. They gotta pull their fair share. New Jersey has a billionaire governor and we get homeless from New Jersey all the time here. And I feel that we are enablers. It's been said before in this council chamber today, we enable people to be drug addicts. We have enabled people to not take care of themselves and to feel that the state should take care of them and stay out of their business and let them do what they want. 
And I've been homeless before myself during the Reagan-Bush recession. I lost my engineering job. I lost everything. There were no jobs. And yet I managed to find work. And I was homeless for a very short time because if I wasn't working, I was looking for work. Right now, there are help wanted signs everywhere. And, but many people don't want to work. They feel that you should be taking care of them. And I think we got to turn that around. And we need mandatory drug and alcohol treatment for people on drugs in this community. Whether they want it or not, they're too, if drug addiction is a disease, they're too sick to know they need help. Thank you. Rebecca Metters. Rebecca? No, she probably gave up. Shannon Gross. And Shannon will be followed by Tom Grant. Hi there, my name is Shannon Grossi. I live in the Whitaker in District 7. And I am here to announce my support for this ordinance. Um, we love living in the Whitaker. We have a young daughter. We are um, also faced with a constant ebb and flow of people who are camping in the median across from our house. Um, the property that's across from our house is the 4J um, maintenance uh, building and I'd really love if they were able to put in beautiful planter boxes instead of having um, to call the non-emergency line every other week. Um, I have felt a increased sense of unsafety for myself, for my daughter, for my family, and I don't want to move. I love my neighborhood, and I, I understand that this is a larger issue than who has control of a parking strip. And my family needs an immediate solution so that we can feel safe in the home and the neighborhood that we have chosen to raise our family. Thank you. Uh, I think she nailed it. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to add that we really are um, compassionate for the unhoused and really do um, support uh, preventative services and um, you know services for drug addiction and everything. Um, but yeah, because of a lot of the drug addiction that accompanies um, homelessness, we do feel unsafe. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Tom Brandt. Followed by Pamela Krauss. Well, I'm against making new rules and laws when there are solutions. And I'm against people living on the grassy strip when there are solutions. Most of those people are forced into it. Of course, if, if I was homeless, I'd be a little farther out of town. I'd build a little fort up in a tree or something where people couldn't see me. I wouldn't sleep on the street like that. <clears throat> but if nothing is done, it will only get worse. And that is exactly what the city, what you people have been doing. Nothing, except for making new rules, regulations, and laws, spending money on failed operations, you know, pushing them from one place to another, harassing the homeless, harassing the people on the Wayne Morris Free Speech Plaza, free speech, free assembly. Make new laws, make new rules for that. That's where the heart, where hard-earned taxpayer money is going, chasing the homeless around and around, wasting taxpayer money. Let's find some solutions. I've said that before. Let's create employment by solving the homeless problem. And I could do that. I did it with recycling. Nobody wanted to recycle. I had to force the county into it. I had to create my own job in the county. 
to be able to get a project going at Glenwood to prove that recycling could create jobs and create money. Of course, at that time, the county wanted to burn the garbage, so they didn't want to recycle. So we had to disperse our information everywhere, and that was really the start of recycling. And the homeless thing, we could do the same thing. We solved the problems, I've said this before, and then we could give other cities. We wouldn't be getting people from other cities because they'd have the same opportunities that they would have here. And I'd like to help if anybody's willing to solve the problem. Thanks. Thank you. Pamela Kraus. Pamela, is she still here? No. Okay, how about Peter Dragovich, followed by Mary Kay. Mayor Venice, uh, members of the council, Peter Dragovich, resident of uh, Ward 5. Uh, homelessness has many causes, uh, but as we know, far fewer lasting solutions. It's hard to find what works, but we clearly know what does not work. Criminalizing homelessness does not reduce homelessness. It only makes it more difficult for the unhoused to enter rental housing. A criminal record, unpaid fines, being in collections in addition to uh, Preventing a landlord from renting to an unhoused person also makes it difficult for a homeless person to secure work. We also know that the leaf blower approach does nothing to reduce or in any way solve this problem. Moving a person from one doorstep to another wastes resources and accomplishes nothing. There's been a lot of uh, public testimony here this evening about the homeless being uh, drug addicted, mental health issues, so forth. Well, the point in time count that was conducted five months ago for this area found that over 70% of homeless do not have those issues, do not, are not, have substance abuse or mental health issues. Over 70% do not. I know you're making many constructive <coughs> efforts to address this issue, but this proposed change is not one of them. It's a step backwards and should be rejected. Thank you. Our final speaker, Mary Kay, she's still here? All right, then we are complete with that public hearing. Uh, I don't know, are there any questions or comments from the council on anything you've heard? All right, so I will officially close that public hearing. And we have an item, action item. Thank you all for coming. Next action item is uh, <coughs> use of future property tax revenue to pay Midtown Arts Center system development charges. Do we have a quick staff presentation. Thank you. Evening, Mayor, City Councilors. You've had a long evening, so I'll keep this fairly brief. I think everyone's relatively um, familiar with, with the project. Um, I'm Michael Kennison with the Community Development Division and um, here to talk to you about the Midtown Art Center project and uh, use of uh, um, future property tax revenue to pay a portion of the FDCs of this project. Um, the Midtown Arts Center is located in a 1600 block of Pearl. It's an interesting uh, mixed use project and it will include 40 market rate condominiums, uh, one and two bedroom units um, with administrative space for nine different arts organizations uh, led by the Eugene Ballet, um, over 10,000 square feet of rehearsal and space for cultural programming. Um, and publicly accessible gallery um, space for the visual arts. The non-residential portion serving the arts community will be owned by the Eugene Ballet and is estimated um, uh, to uh, uh, be or to cost um, $6.2 million. Um, the uh, project, um, there's a rendering in your packet um, so you can kind of see um, what it look, will look like. Um, it's a seven story um, building uh, with underground parking, um, and the art, uh, the arts condo portion of the project will occupy the first two floors um, and extend into portions of the third and fourth um, floors on the interior of the building. And the mm -hmm. residential will occupy the top five floors in front on um, 16th and Pearl. It's truly a local project. It's a local um, developer, builder, um, local owner's rep. Um, and a local construction contractor and estimated to be completed in June of 2020. 
And uh, what we're proposing um, is to pay um, the nonprofit portion of the total SDCs, um, which is estimated at around $155,000 with future property tax revenue. And the benefit um, to the Eugene Ballet will be a dollar for dollar reduction in the cost of purchasing their uh, portion of the building. So the developer for every dollar in savings from the SDC reductions that are gonna pass that on to the ballet. And that will um, help the ballet achieve their goal of keeping the rents um, for the building at below market um, rates. This is, um, uh, exactly the process that we went through in 2014 uh, with the VA clinic, if you recall, and uh, we're um, in the process of um, paying off those SDCs with property tax revenues that started in November of 2017. Um, we think this um, project aligns well with the council goals around accessible and thriving culture and recreation. It provides a number of other community benefits, um, including the ability to expand art opportunities in the community. Um, the ballet's current space is very constrained and they estimate that uh, the new space will allow them to expand their dance studio and provide um, space for an additional um, 150 to 200 children and 50 to 100 adults. Um, it's much needed administrative space, not just for the ballet, but a number of other arts organizations. Um, and it um, will provide growth p potential for all of them. It's estimated that up to 20 new positions um, can be created with the expansion. Um, it provides uh, much needed housing uh, in the Midtown. Um, it's um, uh, aligned with our goals around 20 minute neighborhood. There's nearby shopping and services so to promote um, walking and biking, um, and it pro uh, provides a unique product that we don't um, normally see. It's a condominium project, uh, for so it's an owner occupancy. And then uh, the increased property tax revenues um, that will be generated are a benefit as well. Um, currently, those are estimated at about $9,300 and would increase to about $279,000 once the project is complete. Um, and with that, I just want to clarify what we're asking you is to support our moving ahead with payment of the nonprofit portion of the SDCs with future property tax revenue. Thank you. Do you want to Are put you? the motion? Yes. Oh. I move to approve this. Approve the city manager's proceeding with the city's payment of the non-residential portion of the Midtown Art Center's SD from property tax revenue that the city will receive from the construction of the center. Second. Any questions, comments? <clears throat> All right. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you very much. Thank you for hanging in there through a very long night. Um, I have a request from Councillor Zelenka to consider postponing the, the board and commission votes until Second I that motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, I think we have time on Wednesday to take care of that and everyone's pretty beat up. So uh, with that, thank you very much. We are adjourned.